time isn't always just like the answer, right? Because if you have more time, but you aren't creatively inspired and you're just trying to like crank stuff out, it's uh, that could just suck all of the, it can lead to a very quick burnout, right? You're listening to The Real You, thoughts, ideas, and perspectives from the ordinary and all of us. My name is Dooley, and this podcast is in partnership with Pocket Change, the social platform built to show the real you. I also have no idea what I'm going to do with it yet, as in yep. kind of an idea, but um, I'm more in the just have conversations and see where it goes. But um, yeah, very fun thus far. I feel like I'm just, I'm just, it's very energizing to me to just talk to people about shit they care about (laughs) nice man yeah i feel like that's definitely the right approach of just like get a bunch of content and then just like you'll figure out the rest i'm excited to see what it turns into yeah it's kind of actually already become overwhelming on the part two of it as in now i've got like six or seven hours of (laughs) of yeah conversation i'm like oh no (laughs) yeah well honestly i mean like the (laughs) the easiest way to do it is just to not edit any of it right yeah but then it's also like uh, so i've been well i've been kind of going like in the car on my way to and from like going to the office i'll put it on and then i'll kind of just time stamp sort of sections so i'm trying to do a casual approach to it but um yeah just kind of when i notice like topics shift i'm like okay maybe that's a shift point but I, I'm gonna have to figure out like a little flow for it. Yeah, I mean, it's different. Different audiences are gonna like different methods, right? Like, I mean, I think Tim Ferriss is somebody that's known for like being pretty like open about like cutting things out sometimes and like editing things. Versus someone like Joe Rogan is definitely known for like he streams it live. He doesn't touch any of it ever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like, that's just sort of like. I mean, maybe a guest would be like a little more apprehensive to go on Joe Rogan's, but like, he's just made that clear and like, it ends up being way less work for him. And for me personally, as a listener, I like that because I know nothing's being like, I don't know. I just, I just like that. I just like having it all, you know? Yeah. 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 So there's, there's a little bit of that world too, where maybe because some of them also to your point, it's, I'll be like 30 minutes into listening. I'm like, honestly, I just have enjoyed even re-listening back to this convo. I'm like trying to timestamp them, but it doesn't actually matter that much. So I, yeah, I, I think timestamps can be good for the description and then people mm-hmm. can just skip around if they want. There we go. Maybe that's an idea. I kind of go through the timestamp stamp effort, but just release the whole thing. And then also there's little yeah clips. Okay. I, I like that a lot. I, I personally, I listen to a podcast. Um, I don't know if you know who Lex Friedman is, Yeah, yeah. Um, but he always, he has a really nice detailed timestamp in his description always. So I'll go through his like podcast and look at the, the like different topics and timestamps and like, that's how I decide like which one to listen to. Yeah. 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 So I like, I like that. You do, do you do YouTube or spotify or what's like your i'm on mostly apple podcasts oh. but a little bit of spotify yeah, yeah yeah so what about music then are you apple music or a spotify guy but <laughs> i'm all spotify for music okay i almost like the separation of pod- I, that's like my gripe with spotify's podcast platform is like there's no separation of podcasts and music those are two very different worlds for me yeah and like mixing them together is just like it just feels wrong if i open spotify to like go play music and there it's like in the middle of a podcast yeah <laughs> my, it's just it's like not yeah so my group with spotify is the having to pay to upload songs or you have to go through a distributor and you can't right. independently put stuff up because that's like where and why i'm still in the soundcloud realm so yeah. i love so much of the you know kind of electronic even just total underground whether it be rap or bass or stuff like that is even songs with literally yeah 40 40 to 150 plays i'm like soundcloud's my shit but it's because spotify just doesn't and if you have under a thousand plays it's like you're not relevant and i'm like what is this shit like there's so many people out there who are putting out 
such cool creations that um can't even get access to the spotify stuff because they have to go through a distributor either i know i promote like i used to be a huge soundcloud junkie um but yeah i I think we talked about this before like even soundcloud has sort of fallen victim to Mm -hmm. i mean they basically had like a really awesome user experience but like a really bad business model is what i've gleaned and then they sort of got they basically like ran out of money and got sort of taken over by like more business-minded people and got overrun with ads and stuff but you but soundcloud in its golden age was like the shit i mean like you you didn't go anywhere else for for music because like it had the lowest barrier to entry to upload things so it just had like the most creative and underground stuff um have you been following any of this like um any of the like blockchain stuff with music platforms no i have been in tune with the nft side of the art world which is just more of the concept that you can kind of invest in artists Mm -hmm. under yeah is but not necessarily the music blockchain if that's so so there's two projects that interest me uh one is called audius Mm. and i actually just i like a week ago i uploaded that album that i had that i put out in um the beginning of november i uploaded it to there and um they haven't quite fleshed everything out, but basically like all the music is stored on like IPFS and all that stuff. And like the goal eventually is to be like compensating artists in their like native token and stuff based on like the number of streams, which is a super good model. I seems like that's not totally like fleshed out yet, but gotten audience links from people before. And I'm actually in a discord where some people talk about just these kind of random things. Um, so the other day, I think I got a hint of this conversation where they thought it was a cool thing, but um, they brought up the thought that it could be almost not like scam-esque, but that the company itself with like running the token um, could be kind of sketchy. I actually have no idea. on that Yeah, but- I, I initially was like really jazzed up about the, the concept is legit, right? I mean, like this will be implemented well by somebody. I don't know whether they're the ones to do it, but like streaming stuff that's, you know, like you're basically like able to directly, I mean, the thing that blockchain is really enabling is like peer to peer interactions, including transactions. So if you stream, like I could host my own music on my own server on IPFS and like put those links on Audius. And if you stream those, I get compensated like directly to my wallet based on the streams and it doesn't go through like a third party. So yeah. I think that I'm excited for that to come to fruition. Um, but then there's another one that pertains to the NFT stuff you were talking about a little more. And this is one I haven't looked into yet, but I think I like it sounds maybe even more exciting. So it's called sound.xyz. Okay. And essentially what you can do is you like you release a song along with an nft drop of like let's say 25 that represents like a fraction of that song and so basically like you can buy this nft and it gives you essentially like that fraction like some fraction of let's say you're distributing 50 percent of your revenue to token holders Mm -hmm. like if you buy one of 25 of the nft you'll be getting a 50th of all proceeds from that song being streamed on any platform like being streamed anywhere and like this ecosystem definitely has a long way to develop but like basically in 10 years what i visualize is like people can become like you could literally build a career around like picking up and coming artists like it democratizes the record label it crowdsources the record label i basically my own tiny record label where i just buy nfts and I'm betting on these up and coming artists because I think I have good taste. Mm-hmm. And like a couple of those pop off. I buy, a, you know, an NFT like of the weekend song, like from 10 years ago. Yeah. I'm fucking rich as shit, you know? Um, wow. So I, I love, this is actually something super interesting. Because even in high school, we had this conversation. And now I honestly, with my roommates, have, there's almost a competitive aspect to finding unheard music within yes. a lot of like certain subsets of my friends where it's um 
like that's the the thing is like you get into the car and it's like yo like this song it's like whoa what is this like yeah that's like the whole point but also when you kind of yeah think about that from the joy of finding artists and music that are having these uh, moments of like possibly getting their path up like to actually put some kind of financial backing into that and be like yeah, oh, yeah. and it also then supports the artists in the meantime of hey look like your things whatever great to me i'm going to put some money towards you now and then yeah um, no it, it, yeah so it's great it's it can create a career for people to to literally do what you're talking about but then yeah on the flip side as an artist it's super exciting because like you could release a song and like immediately make ten thousand dollars in proceeds from the nfts like like it, it just yeah it exposes a way to actually have a hope at making a living and it's not just like here buy this nft because like you want to support me like almost a donation it's like here buy a profit share yeah, of, yeah like yeah. the actual proceeds of my music like mm-hmm. so do you really cool one of the um things i kind of keep hearing about the nft and decentralizing um financial system is that as it starts to gain momentum say for example in this instance a label itself would just go in and buy out all of the possibility of that say artist person and then hence gaining some sort of control back does that how do you think that plays into this situation of like because i guess the label wouldn't actually be owning the music isn't telling you you could put it out or not it's more of owning a share and just how well it does so do you think it wouldn't then be a negative impact if basically do you think there's a way to take this over in a kind of corrupt domineering way from the label and music industry probably probably um i think we're seeing like i think that's definitely a theme like that I've been picking up on in like the web three world and the blockchain world is like, I think when you first like take the pill, you're like, like, this is going to fix everything. And this is like the antidote to like literally everything. Um, But there's definitely a disillusionment phase that comes of like, you know, like largely a lot of this stuff like tends to centralize again anyways. Um, And yeah, I, I think you're right. But at the very least, you know, even if it is used that way, it will put at least like some competition into the mix of like, at least like, at least it can disrupt the record label industry, like give it like some punches to the face, like maybe like a pool of like a bunch of individual people like can actually have a group that like competes with real record labels and like, yeah, it. Also, I, I don't think it's a cure-all, but... Yeah, yeah. I've also thought about, too, you know, in pop culture and with the Grammys and there's big name artists, There, that's a whole industry in itself. There are people I know, and especially of now getting deeper into the, the kind of more underground bass scene is there are people who, even in my eyes, are like legends of production, killing it, of this beautiful music, all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, that guy's like, if I reached out to him, not like he's out of reach, all this stuff. And when you actually kind of like take a step back again, it's, they have a few thousand followers on SoundCloud and like maybe a thousand followers on Instagram. Mm. Yet they're going around and doing like countrywide tours because they've nailed like a subculture of Mm. music and they've like found their way within a certain audience type and people who like this alternate sort of thing. Um, And so I think this actually does apply super well into that of realizing you actually don't need this supersonic level of fame or songs to blow up you need to build basically a subculture that you're a part of or at least dabble in multiple so you can kind of get different audiences in different ways but um Mm -hmm. yeah the more niche the better um, this actually is super applicable to that because i would do i would fucking buy buy in on these artists who are going around and touring even if it's just a couple thousand followers they're fucking murdering it and yeah making dope dope tracks and i'm like there's a scene for it so absolutely um yeah i i think uh i forget who said this but like i think like a thousand true fans uh, does that ring a bell yeah 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 i, I, actually, yeah. I like keep seeing it in a way um, yeah it's, 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 i thought they're when they talk about it though they're like a thousand people who um 
would spend like avidly yeah yeah which is depending on how many you know depending on how much money you need to live on yeah each person spends 60 you get 60,000 a year right yeah yeah and that comes down to the 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 problem with that is even myself this also might just be myself personally how affluent is your audience is your niche (laughs) even as someone who i'm an avid fan of people although to I don't know, but even their ticket price is a chunk it's taken out. I don't know. I like just don't spend that much on mm-hmm. yeah. the artists. Like there's a handful of people who I'm super fans of, like listen to all their shit whenever they drop it. If they have merch things, I don't really like spend on all of them though. So you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I kind of have to, um, so I'm a little bit skeptical of the a thousand true to like longevity. Yeah. But, also, I think that sentiment is coming from a thousand, like deep true, but at the same time, you need the subset larger than that, also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the more niche, the better for sure. Mm. Yeah, these yeah. days. Yeah, it's also kind of weird. Um, I've noticed with the shows and stuff. So I always had this thing where you watch other people um, performing shows and stuff, and you see photos of them on stage and stuff. And I did one a couple months ago, and it felt like extremely just like magical in the way I did an all original set thing, had a bunch of um, my friends like come out and and all that stuff. And I actually came to realize during the show and after that, while I'm looking at my phone or Instagram or I see all these people playing these shows or booking around things. In reality, there's still sometimes only four to 12 people showing up. And you get it in your head that, oh my God, they're going around and they're playing these shows and they're way bigger of an artist than I am. Like, this is it. When I went and did the show, it was like, I had brought essentially 40 to 50 people there and with tickets at whatever, 10, 20, I think they were actually $20. Like essentially that was in one night, a thousand dollars generated for, and I didn't get paid that out. But yeah. in terms of what you're actually conceptualizing is like a large fan base versus a, like a solid community around it is right you know, coming to serve my friends but then there's also you know the grinding over the five years and then they're like oh no this will be like a cool fun experience and i think it actually was and so um a little bit of that you get distracted by numbers online when in reality like what are the human beings who are going to show up to the shows who are going to stream your new shit and keep intact with it and um I don't know. Yeah, it's something that kind of just threw me for a whirl a bit where I was like, wait a second. Yeah, like 50 people is a lot if they actually all show up to your show. Yeah. But 50, yeah. 50 plays, you know, 50 yeah. followers is considered just absolutely nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was a big, that was a wake up for myself personally. I'm like. Yeah, numbers are different in the real world for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, and it was a positive wake up call. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. There's something here that's a little bit special about like what's going on i just got to figure out kind of yeah how to keep just doing my yeah own and finding my way with it do you do you think i mean where are you in the i know you go back and forth like i do on the like monetization of music mm-hmm. like where are you on that spectrum these days it would be a nice bonus <laughs> <laughs> um my i think my constant thought around it is is the second it becomes my sole reliance Mm. it changes the way that i would i i'm assuming it would change the way that i approach that i approach it because now all of a sudden survival for me but yeah there's people around on your team who are doing the shows doing these things where um your product is now what it becomes no longer just a song or a thing you made in your room last night it becomes a product that you have to distribute and it has to distribute well and it has to lead to sales on this and you have to get the merch up and so um i guess that's just my thought with it is there's a weird pressure to it but a little bit of yeah but also it doesn't have to it's not like this just one moment defines your thing and then it's gone forever I'm, I'm this is where i come back to the whole production like the producing end of things is that's only an upward journey like you only get better at producing and learning song strategies and all that and with that in mind there will be highs and lows of maybe you have a rock and year you put out a project 
and you go and tour, all of a sudden you have to quit your other job because you're making money. And then next year you can't book a tour you do and it doesn't sell anything. And then you're like, that doesn't mean your career is over. Like it's just reshifting again where the money has to come from. Maybe it's another job and you have to focus more on your new songs again. Or um, So I think that's my, my thought with it is it's not something I'm opposed to, but it's not something I'm trying, I'm trying to, Mm-hmm. it's something i'm trying to make the best shit i possibly can and bring the best art forward and if that starts to lead into a spot where money begins to come from it um mm-hmm. then we put that money back into the same art we hopefully have an opportunity and privilege to share that art and be a performance or whatever and then reevaluate again um, yeah i think that's my what, what about with you and in your music journey yeah i i um I, I largely agree with all of that. Um, I think it depends on like what you're trying to optimize for, right? So like, I, I think you said it well in the last part of that of like, you basically want to optimize for the best possible art or like the best possible music, the music that you like the most and creating the most music that you actually wanted to make um and so for me like I go back and forth on like you know well if this was like a you know like full-time career I would have more time to do it but is that necessarily true maybe maybe not but also like time isn't always just like the answer right because if you have more time but you aren't creatively inspired and you're just trying to like crank stuff out it's uh that could just suck all of the it can lead to a very quick burnout right yeah um and so that's something i worry about a lot with that whole side of things and the alternative is if i can lead a more balanced life where i've you know, fund, I'm able to fund all of the music equipment and I'm able to have like the freedom with my time um, such that I can act on creative inspiration. Uh, I think that's the ideal Mm -hmm. scenario for me. Um, I, I, yeah. And, you know, like you said, if it blows up into more than that, then like, cool i'm i'm here for it but yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, I i think trying to make it a full-time career is not the approach that i want to take yeah 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 that's and i think that's where i align not just with the music stuff but um even in my own exploring journey or even doing this kind of podcast style thing right is as i start to think about what direction do i want my life to lead in and kind of get to that I- ideal world, which even then you never know if it's actually what you want. But right mm-hmm. now, taking a lot of time to think about things that make me happy, like what are those? And then how can I kind of wiggle my way back into where I am right now? And then am I heading in that direction? And mm-hmm. so whether it's like with the music stuff, like I, I want, I've had my most magical experiences, first off in, full immersive headphone or car experience where I'm just really, really listening and feeling the music, right? So not just, oh, turning on the car, but like I'm in that zone. And that to me is the magic of the artist and the pr- production coming together to take me into this world. Mm-hmm. And then the really kind of things that I'm almost chasing are the things I've in a live setting, being in that kind of moment, um, combined with the atmosphere of the crowd and the actual performance itself and knowing that that's a special magical place that's gotten me through just a lot of things and how much it does with other people is Mm -hmm. I've been to plenty of shows now. I still love going to them, but like being on that other side is like, I've gotten little tastes of it. And it's just such a exciting thing to me of going in and crafting this world and then taking other people through it even if they don't love it, but it's like, <clears throat> yeah, you know, went through a world that was created, it like feels genuinely like magic. Um, optimize for that. 
Is yeah, that- no, I think that's the right. So, yeah, I think there's a fundamental difference here that I, I think I realized kind of like somewhat recently um, in the last year of like an egoic pursuit versus a, a pursuit to provide value. Um, and I think the classic way and sort of the easiest way to pursue music or art or whatever it may be is to try to become a superstar mm-hmm. where, you know, you want to hit new numbers and you want to, you know, have more and more followers and status and fame and money and just like be a star and have your music like blow up. And like that I think is a, is a a bottomless pit of despair to pursue. Um, And I think the most stark contrast, I actually went to, um, I went to like a sound bath Mm -hmm. um, sort of workshop and the, basically you just lay down on the ground, Mm -hmm. um, you know, with like pillows and blankets and stuff for like two or three hours and uh listen to like you know there are all sorts of like worldly instruments and synthesizers and i mean this guy had a full-on like he had towers with subwoofers like on either side of the room and like it was like a full-on like immersive experience it was amazing um and that's like a very stark contrast to that pursuit of stardom and i talked to him for a while afterwards and he actually had moved from LA from the like pursuit of stardom and into this, like it's a much more humble way to approach music where like you're just in a room and 10 people, you're providing 10 people with this really powerful experience. And like, it's, it's a way more selfless way to approach Mm -hmm. music and um, talking about that and sort of like internalizing that um, along with just, yeah, it reminded me a lot of like some of the experiences that we had in mm-hmm. Peru of like really like sound and music as mm-hmm. like really a valuable thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like looking at it as providing people value, I think is just mm-hmm. a much healthier lens um, to approach for me anyways. Um, yeah. Well, it also starts from, it does start from yourself too, right? Like, some people, and this is also where there's no flaw to either of these things, but um, there's like bang in concert. And then there's like where it's a big party, kind of more club atmosphere. And then there's sort of yeah, that sort of sonic adventure type of concert. And then there's there's intertwined versions of those where it's fucking mm-hmm. a bang sonic adventure. Oh, yeah. Actually- oh, and I, I, I think, I mean, I've gotten incredible, like you were describing, like I've gotten incredible experiences being at like huge shows that are just absolutely pounding and i think i think it provides value to people like in at the end of the day if you become successful it's because you are providing value to people whether or not that was the goal you set out to do or what ratio there was present Mm -hmm. is is unknown but i think yeah if you're looking to like make huge shows and like that's the way you want to go because like that's where you derive the most value i think that's still like a valid approach right no and it can be because even thinking about too what what the bigger show actually kind of entails is say with me personally like i love the like big sound yeah like i like the feeling of two point when you're saying subwoofers up the wall Mm-hmm, yeah one little room and do that which i think would be awesome but otherwise it's hard to get access to those things and it's yes. hard for people to jump into those but when you get mm-hmm. on a big stage and with a large system and then on top of that you get there's enough financial backing to actually have someone on your team that's providing more custom visuals for your to match your sonic journey on top of that live doing the lights and lasers and it becomes mm-hmm. in this just leveled up early more immersive yes piece becomes more and more immersive and so sometimes that's also where it's it's not that the goal is to get the stardom or the fame of right 
playing on the big stage. It's like, well, no, the big stage actually just provides a that lot experience. of world for more people to come and have that much more of an immersive experience. Um, but there's it's- also the communal aspect too, right? Like when you have tens of thousands of people, like all riding the same wave, like it's definitely a powerful experience.